Okay, I forgot one little thing I wanted to include about the solubility and error that might be experienced in the experiment in the lab. Um, so if we're thinking about, um, again, this reaction, The question is, does the pH of like your water influence um, this reaction at all? And the answer, of course, is yes. So when we go back to thinking about the common ion effect from the beginning of chapter 17, it becomes um, obvious that, of course, the pH of your solvent is going to influence how much solid you dissolve. And this is something, in fact, that we have been using in the qual scheme all along. When you manipulate the pH, that is usually to get certain things to dissolve and other things not to. All right, so for example, if we already had some of your hydroxide here in the solution, when you put the calcium hydroxide in, it's not going to shift as far to the left as it would have if the hydroxide weren't there. Similarly, if you had calcium present, right, they both would influence the amount of shifting that occurs. Um, by the way, a lot of our tap water is contaminated with a lot of lime water. We have, we have that from our geology in this area. So that's the white stuff you see precipitating on your shower head. So if I wanted to get more of this calcium to dissolve, what I could do is, is put it into some acidified water, right? So if you have acid there to begin with, it's going to draw this equilibrium farther to the right. That's what those cleaning products that remove lime do. They're just acids and they remove the solid by shifting this equilibrium to the right by reacting the hydroxide. All right. Um, so yes, the pH of the solvent absolutely affects how much solid you can produce. I said pH of the solvent, right? I hope I did. That's what I meant. Okay, so we've talked before about Lewis acids, and I've mentioned complex ions to you on a number of occasions, but here's where it really sort of coalesces a little bit. So um, a lot of metals can form complex ions. So that's what happens when you take something um, and make an ionic compound that exceeds, it, it doesn't have a neutral charge. So one example from chapter nine, toward the end of the uh, analysis of silver, you make this complex ion. Um, so just to outline it, you're going to start with silver ion and you add ammonia to it, two of them, and it turns out you're going to form this complex ion. And that's not the very last step of the reaction, but ammonia is neutral, so adding two of those does not change the charge. This is a complex ion because it's complex together when you have a metal with stuff attached to it, we call it a complex. And it's of course an ion. So these are always aqueous. And when you do your net ionic equations, they do not break apart. They stay this way, okay? We saw a whole bunch of examples of this kind of thing, like iron and cyanide will form a complex ion in chapter 11 and such things like that. So pay attention to those. They do not get broken up when you do your net ionic equations. All right, so looking at this picture in the textbook, it's a really good way to understand what you're doing when you're manipulating the pH, right? And so when we start with that silver chloride in chapter nine, we add ammonia so that it reacts and forms that complex ion, which is um, aqueous, okay? Eventually all of that solid would react if it was all silver ion. Mercury and uh, lead don't do this. I don't think lead does this. We separate lead before you get to this stage, but I don't think it would do this anyway. So Ag just has special chemistry that allows this to happen, Ag plus. And so you get an aqueous solution if you only have silver present at that point. And then of course the next step to precipitate the silver and confirm that it's there is when you add the nitric acid. Okay, so in chapter 11, we manipulate aluminum in a similar way. Um, Aluminum is amphoteric though, so that means that it dissolves in both acidic and basic conditions, which is different from silver, which, which would, would only dis dissolve in basic conditions, but in acidic conditions it stays. And that's why adding nitric acid to this mixture is going to make the AGCL appear again. Okay. 
so it's about pH. But with aluminum, it's a bit trickier. So you have to be really careful to manage the pH really well when you're trying to identify aluminum. So if we have added hydroxide, the white powdery, often hard to see, aluminum hydroxide solid will form a complex ion, which is aqueous, of course. You can't see it at all. On the other hand, if I start with aluminum um, hydroxide and I add some acid to it, you're going to get aluminum 3 plus, which is also soluble. So it's really only at very specific pHs that you get aluminum hydroxide solid, even though we would classify aluminum hydroxide as insoluble, right? It depends heavily on the pH. So that's what we've been doing in the qual scheme all along. And if the right Lewis base is present, you'll see the precipitate if you get the pH just right. And if you don't, you won't, okay? Um, so we also are using other things that are not acids and bases to choose what gets precipitated. So like, for example, if I gave you a mixture of say silver and copper ions, you could separate them just by adding chlorine because chloride will precipitate with silver, but not with copper. That's called selective precipitation. We're choosing when a given ion comes out of solution. So let's say for example, um, what we do in qual scheme is qualitative. It's not quantitative, but if I were being very careful with my quantitation, I could separate silver and bromine, I'm sorry, silver and lead using anything in group 17, like bromine. I chose chloride, chloride in this one, but um, the way it works is by comparing KSPs, all right? And so I pulled these KSPs from our textbook, and basically, we can figure out what concentration of chloride will precipitate each sample based on the Ks. And whichever one is lower is the one that precipitates first. So you can imagine kind of doing like a titration almost, where you're adding chloride ion really slowly to get it just the right concentration to get one of them to precipitate, but not the other one. All right. And so that's called selective precipitation. All right, so this is going to be an ice table and it's a precipitate, so we're going to treat it as a KSP. And so this one has a value uh, very small, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10. Like that, okay. And so we have a 0.01, oops, wrong spot. We're trying to figure out how to get the solid to form. So what we actually know is 0 0.01 molar of this. And the question is, how much chloride do we have to add to make this reaction shift to the left, essentially? You'll note that we don't need to know the concentration of the solid because that's meaningless. There's not a molarity of a solid. So we're just going to plug this in. This will be X. There's no coefficients in this reaction, so it's one to one. So 1.8 e to the negative 10 divided by 0 0.01 to find out that X here, so that's the amount of chloride, is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 8 molarity. Well, that's tiny. Ignore that streak. So for the lead, for the lead, it would be PBCL2 because it's 2 plus. So I'm out, I'm laying this out the same way that you should in terms of like each step does need to be accomplished because if you just looked at the Ks, you would probably assume that silver is going to precipitate first, which might be true. I don't know. Uh, but it doesn't account for the fact that there is a difference in these solubilities, right? So Cl minus has to be squared. So we're also starting with different concentrations of the metal. So that would influence what you get as well. 
it's easier to just do the calculation than to try to rationalize these problems. And this will be why. So again, I'm going to go 1.7 e to the negative 5. And I'm dividing by 0.02 to get rid of that. And then I have to take the square root of that number. And I get a chloride ion concentration that is actually pretty high, right? So I, if I put just a tiny, tiny amount of chloride in there, I'm going to get silver to precipitate. If I separate that solid and then put more chloride in there, I'll also get lead precipitated, PbCl2. Okay, so that's how you can use the Ks to quantify the concentration of things needed. In lab, we don't bother to do that. We just say, keep adding chlorine until all the stuff precipitates, right? Um, and then we do further work, wet chemistry, to figure out how to separate them. For chapter 10, looking at copper, all right, and so for 10 and 11, you actually use sulfide ion as the initial reactant to precipitate both groups. The difference is in the pH, okay? So if you have a mixture, let's say, of copper and zinc, which is chapter 10 and chapter 11, and you added the sulfur, we did this in a slightly different chemical, but that's basic. You, you make the H2S in the test tube instead of bubbling it because it stinks. Um, so if we have this mixture of things, it's going to, at a low pH, only precipitate the, the copper. Then if you remove that solid, that black gunky solid, and put in some base of some sort, we used ammonia or ammonium hydroxide, same thing, in lab, what you're going to get at a high pH is the zinc will precipitate then. So that's the main difference between chapter 10 and chapter 11. It's pH, low for chapter 10, high for chapter 11. OK, so that's your sort of summary of um, the qual scheme and how it applies to solubility calculations. And I hope it's helpful in your work toward the end of the semester as we're starting to work on the assignments um, that wrap up your lab experience.